Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 5th, 2019, and before introducing today's guest, I want to make a few remarks about the recent Econ Talk survey of your favorite episodes of last year. A little over 2,400 people listening in 65 countries filled out the survey, which I'm very grateful for. You gave me some wonderful feedback and some great ideas. Uh, many of you remain unaware of the archives of Econ Talk. You can find every episode we've ever recorded, which is now about 670-something, uh, at econtalk.org. But it's much easier to download a year of past episodes at a time. You can do that by searching Econ Talk on the podcast app of your iPhone or on an app like Podbean uh, or other players, I assume. And that'll allow you to not just access the main subscription feed, but you'll see annual uh, episode collections going back to 2006. You can download all the episodes of 2006, 2007 if you want. Uh, and uh, feel free, please, to do that and, and listen. It's also a wonderful app for the iPhone uh, that just plays Econ Talk episodes and is extremely well designed. It is not uh, designed by us here at Econ Talk, but it's very, very nice. If you search Econ Talk at the iPhone App Store, it will pull up an app that's simply called Economics, but it's all Econ Talk all the time. Check it out. Uh, I love suggestions generally, especially for guests. Uh, do check the archives. Uh, some of the suggestions I received in the survey are people we've already interviewed. Uh, so check those out. And sometimes, unfortunately, there are guests who turn me down. So sometimes if I don't have a guest on that you love, I've been trying uh, and uh, appreciate your, your help. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at EconTalker. Some of you said it'd be great if we could find out about upcoming guests. Uh, on Twitter, I usually uh, do that. I usually let listeners and people who follow me on Twitter uh, know what some of the upcoming guests are in the books uh, that they're going to be talking about. So if you want to get to those in advance, uh, Twitter is following me on Twitter is uh, one way to do that. And now for your favorite episodes of uh, 2018. Number 10, Bill James on baseball, facts, and the rules of the game. Number nine, Michael Pollan on psychedelic drugs and how to change your mind. Number eight, Ryan Holiday on conspiracy, Gawker, and the Hulk Hogan trial. Number seven, Nassim Nicholas Taleb on rationality, risk, and skin in the game. Number six, Michael Munger on sharing transaction costs and tomorrow 3.0. And now for the top five. Number five, Frank DeCotter on Mao's Great Famine. Number four, Brian Kaplan on The Case Against Education. Number three, Sebastian Younger on Tribe. Number two, Jordan Peterson on 12 Rules for Life. And the most popular episode, as voted by listeners, Jonah Goldberg on The Suicide of the West, which received just over 25% on uh, uh, in the balloting. That is one of – one in every four of, resp of the respondents uh, rated that in their uh, top their top five. And finally, I want to mention that we had 6.6 .6 million downloads last year. Um, that's way above our previous high of last year, which was 5.1 million. Uh, for the first time, we had an episode with over 100,000 downloads, and it happened three times. Uh, the Jordan Peterson episode, 115,000. The Nassim Taleb episode with 112,000. And Jonah Goldberg with 106,000. And Sebastian Younger's episode may end up at that high as well. But being at the, end of the year, did, at the end of the year, it didn't have as much time to accumulate downloads. I appreciate all your, all your time, both as survey respondents and as listeners so much. Uh, and your feedback. Please spread the word about Econ Talk to friends and family. And now for today's guest, Catherine Semser. She's a research fellow with PERC, the Property and Environment Research Center, where she works on market-based solutions for various environmental issues. She's the past chief operating officer of HOPE, which is Humanitarian Operations Protecting Elephants, which works to reduce poaching in Africa. 
During her tenure with Hope, she was responsible for leading the opening of projects in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Ethiopia. Catherine, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me, Russ. I want to start by talking about poaching, uh, the killing of protected or endangered wildlife, and the nature of the problem in Africa. Uh, why is it such a big problem? And, uh, and, it, and it seems to be a particularly important issue in Africa. Well, the reason it's a problem is is fairly multifaceted. You know, first and foremost, you have the loss of loss of what is a valuable resource for the people of Africa. Um, tourism is a tremendously large industry in Africa, valued at about forty billion dollars, according to the World Travel and Tourism Council, and it provides about six percent of total employment on the continent. And People are coming to see the elephants and the rhinos and the lions and the other species. And every uh, illegal killing uh, of one of these animals essentially represents uh, a theft of sorts uh, from the people whose livelihoods depend on these animals. Uh, but there's also a security element to it as well. Um, much of the poaching uh, is being driven by uh, international organized crime syndicates, and there's also armed militant groups who are poaching in order to raise funds to procure weapons and uh, other materials so that they can uh, wage war against the established governments of Africa. And if, just to be clear for listeners who, who don't know the term or maybe uh, English is not your native language, poaching is the, the killing of an animal uh, that is otherwise uh, protected uh, in, in America. It could happen in a national park. It could happen on a ranch of a private uh, in private ownership. But in Africa, we're mainly talking, I assume, about uh, game preserves, the equivalent of a, of a national park in America. Uh, well, the game preserves are slightly different. So if you look at Africa's conservation system, uh, it's slightly more diverse than what we have here in the United States. Uh, you do have national parks, for sure, places like Amboseli, um, you know, which are world famous. But then there's also an extensive system of game ranches where you, know, you will find everything from elephants to rhino to kudu to springbok. Um, and then there's also what they call wildlife utilization areas um, as sort of a broad category. And these are areas that are set aside for the sustainable use of wildlife, either uh, through uh, hunting by local people to feed themselves, uh, or more often than, than not, the, uh, the hunting rights are leased out to other concessionaires and um, used for trophy hunting purposes in order to raise, uh, to raise funds. So what are some of the steps? So the obvious solution, of course, uh, to most people is to make poaching illegal, but that's – it already is illegal. Uh, the problem mm -hmm. is it's hard to enforce boundaries. It's hard to enforce um, and monitor these laws. So what are some of the ways that uh, governments and, and others have tried to reduce the, uh, the killing uh, of animals that uh, people would otherwise want to keep alive? Well, what we've seen – um, widely across the landscape since uh, elephant poaching in particular began to spike at around in around 2008 has been a very um, militant and, and, and militarized approach to counter poaching, um, sort of building on the fortress conservation area that we can somehow wall off these areas of habitat, um, not just with fences as were done historically, but increasingly with helicopters and, and um, high-powered rifles and um, um, staff that had military training. And what we've seen is this has had mixed effectiveness. Um, it's really, uh, to a large part, alienated local populations um, from the idea of wildlife conservation. And there was a study that was published by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the United Nations, um, and the International Institute for Environment and Development, which showed that the real way that we need to, to get at addressing the poaching problem is to build support among the people who live among the wildlife of Africa and essentially uh, disrupt the supply chain of ivory and rhino horn um, closer to the source 
by increasing the opportunity costs for engaging in poaching. And that can be achieved in, in a number of ways, but one of the most common ways to do this is through the, the aforementioned trophy hunting programs where people are economically benefiting from having healthy populations of wildlife over the long term, managing it as a renewable resource as opposed to um, killing large numbers of animals in a short period of time just to get a quick cash return. And I want to come back to that, uh, and we'll go into it in some depth, but the the other strategy has been to um, try to make illegal or reduce the trade in the horns of, these ele- of the elephants and rhinos, which are typically uh, sold around the world as an aphrodisiac. Uh, or possibly, I guess, in the past for jewelry, but I assume, or art, but I assume it's mainly um, the aphrodisiac use that's been dominating. But that also has not been terribly successful. The reduction in those in that trade is that correct? Uh, again, it's it's met with mixed success. You know, I just saw some some research recently showing that while. Um, you know, ivory consumption and, and rhino horn consumption in China has been on the decline domestically. Chinese who travel overseas are still buying at historic rates. And, you know, part of what's driven this was, you know, the rise of the the, uh, the middle class in China. Um, you're dealing with a, a culture that has uh, a value, you know, placed on ivory and rhino horn going back thousands of years. And as people's spending power increased, you know, they, of course, went for, you know, what have long been seen within that culture as luxury goods. Now, there's been some, you know, economic downturns in China recently. Some people's purchasing uh, power has decreased, but for those Chinese who who can still travel overseas, um, the idea of, you know, reducing consumption does not seem to have stuck very well. So one of the solutions, which which you mentioned, is the trying to incentivize uh, the local population. Uh, you know, it's a complicated problem, obviously. Although some of the poachers are – some of them, I presume, could be local. Many of them are, are not local. But the idea here is to give some kind of property right or incentive – a type of ownership, you know, people will often say when you talk about a market-based solution or an ince- – I call I call it an incentive-based solution, these kind of problems, they'll say, yeah, but you can't own an elephant. Well, you could. You could obviously – you could tag an elephant and, and in some dimension give yourself property rights in it. Um, but what they, what they actually do on the ground is a little bit different. So talk about how uh, NGOs, organizations that are trying to help – preserve these species have have used ironically the possibility of hunting as a way to increase population it's one of the great examples to me of of the paradox of economics and how often what you assume is the effect is not quite the um, the fact it's a little more complicated Right. Well, you know, let's take elephants as an example that you mentioned. Um, I've had a, a great deal of experience with elephants. I've fed them by hand in captivity. I've been charged by them in the wild. They are absolutely magnificent and, and humbling creatures to, to stand before. Um, but they also, you know, do cause uh, problems for people who have to live with them. They trample crops. They do kill people from time to time, and living with them can be quite uh, quite a challenge, you know, for people who who make their lives in rural Africa. And probably one of the best examples of elephant conservation over the last several decades has been the Campfire Program in Zimbabwe. Uh, Campfire stands for a Communal Areas Management Program for Indigenous Resources. And this is a program that was set up with the support of USAID back in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. And what it does is it gives local communities use rights over the wildlife uh, in a given area. And they can use that wildlife either for subsistence purposes, to put meat on their own table, or typically what happens is the community enters into a partnership with a hunting outfitter um, to uh, you know, leverage those use rights and allowing Americans primarily, Americans represent about 70% of the global trophy hunting market, to come in and engage in those hunts. 
Um, this is a program that has about 2.4 million beneficiaries and uh, impacts about 800,000 households in Zimbabwe. Um, since it was instituted, um, we've seen a 15 to 25 percent income uh, increase in the campfire areas. And this is significant when you consider that 63% of the people in Zimbabwe live below the poverty line. Uh, 2.4 million people in that country are food insecure. Um, and about 27% of the children in that country are, are stunted. So you know, the way that this works is that when they enter into these uh, partnerships with the, with the safari hunters, is there's a, a, a split of the revenues. Um, sometimes it's 50-50, sometimes um, it's 60-40, um, but the community keeps the majority of the revenue from the sale of the hunt. So the impact of this has been to create an incentive for allowing more elephants on the landscape um, because they're bringing in a, a sustained source of income. And since the campfire area was put into place, we've seen a doubling of the elephant population within the campfire areas. And it's one reason that Zimbabwe has the second largest elephant population in all of Africa. Um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's a very fragile system that's vulnerable to, to the politics of the dominant market, namely the United States. Uh, when the United States instituted a ban on the import of elephant trophies from Zimbabwe back in 2014, uh, we saw a 30% decline in Zimbabwe's um, safari hunting industry. And what that looked like on the ground um, was decreased anti-poaching capacity. Uh, the organization I used to work with, HOPE, was uh, working to support uh, one of the anti-poaching units that, that operated in the Donde Safari area. And they reported seeing a five-fold increase in elephant poaching following the institution of the ban. Um, why was this? It was a combination of factors. You know, First and foremost, uh, elephants were no longer generating revenue for local people. So they immediately had less value um, in large numbers and, and more value um, dead on the ground than their tusks ripped out and, and smuggled elsewhere. Uh, at the same time, the de decrease in revenue also meant that the anti-poaching unit uh, could not patrol as much just because they couldn't pay the salaries of the men who would be doing that patrolling. So I've always been fascinated by this. I wrote about it in my book, uh, The Invisible Heart. But of course, many people find it morally repugnant. They find hunting morally repugnant. And this kind of solution is the kind of solution that economists love and a lot of non-economists hate. Uh, they view hunting as immoral. The idea of seeing a herd of elephants as a uh, cash cow, to coin a phrase, disturbs them, and they would rather do almost anything uh, as an alternative to uh, keeping the uh, – preserving the, the size of the, of the herd. I see we've heard those arguments, and um, what do you say in response? Uh, I have heard those arguments, uh, and in response, you know, the first thing I would say is I am not a big game hunter. Um, this is not something that, that I engage in. But you know, I always ask those people, well, what is the alternative? Because if there was an alternative, my guess is we would be implementing it by now. Um, also, you know, who are we in the United States or in the United Kingdom or, or elsewhere to tell Africans how, how they should be managing their wildlife? Programs like Campfire and similar community-based programs had their genesis within these African communities. They have buy-in from the people on the continent. And I certainly understand the discomfort that some people might feel, but I would encourage them to, to be very careful about how they tread on this issue, lest we get back into some type of eco-colonialism in dealing with our African partners. Um, some people will say that, you know, photo tourism uh, is, is a, a viable alternative to trophy hunting. And in some places, that may or may not be true. But what we know um, from the available research, uh, primarily from Namibia, is that if hunting was eliminated in the community conservancies, 84% of those conservancies would no longer be economically viable. Now, what does that mean on the ground? 
um, that means more than 12 million acres of wildlife habitat immediately becomes more vulnerable to development. That's roughly an area five times the size of Yosemite National Park. So I understand the discomfort, but what are our alternatives? People like myself are, are very willing to listen and you know, would love to hear what they are, but they just have not been offered and, and they're certainly not being employed on the ground right now. I guess two things come to mind. You know, one is we could fund or help fund. Uh, I, I'm also sensitive to the eco-colonialism charge, by the way, not necessarily on the narrowest of grounds of eco-colonialism, but more on the idea that I like to let human beings craft their own lives as they see fit. And I'm not so comfortable telling other people what to do with their lives. But if if you are one of those people, <laughs> you're an interventionist of sorts, uh, you, you could certainly argue that we should just be funding better efforts to monitor and protect these animals uh, from poachers. Why is that not a viable alternative? Well, one, it's not sustainable. You know, that money has to come from somewhere. And, you know, to pay it out year after year after year is just not sustainable. Um, we are doing that in places like national parks uh, in Africa, where there is limited to, to no hunting in many cases. And there's still poaching taking place. And the reason that poaching is taking place is because people do not have the buy-in to the conservation model because they're not seeing a material benefit um, from the conservation activities like they are in places like Namibia uh, and in the campfire areas in Zimbabwe. Um, there certainly is room you know, for, for philanthropy. And, you know, we're seeing that play out very well in terms of setting up um, or reestablishing conservation efforts. Places like Gorongosa National Park um, in, in Mozambique is a prime example and the work of the Carr Foundation there. But at some point, those efforts are going to need to become self-sustaining, like the Campfire Program is, like the Namibian conservancies are. And, until we find a way to do that that doesn't involve um, hunting, uh, it's going to, to it's going to be hunting. Um, similarly, uh, not all places are suitable for photo tourism. If you go to most of these wildlife use areas in Africa, they are not the scenic landscapes that you find in the national parks, um, and they typically have smaller densities of the wildlife that people want to photograph. Um, they don't have the infrastructure that's needed to you know, support a photo tourism business. They're often difficult to get to. They can be physically dangerous in terms of, um, of hazards that are, are present. And uh, photo tourism is often just not an economically viable idea for these areas. So we have to come up with some type of program um, lest they, they become developed. And that's a real real threat that I think a lot of conservationists miss. I mean, Africa is a continent of 54 countries. 26 of them are ranked as the poorest on earth by the World Bank. There's 1.2 billion people living on the continent. 27% um, of them are considered food insecure. 589 million of them live without electricity. 37% of them live uh, without access to clean water. That's the bad news. The, the good news maybe is that the IMF just said at the, the most recent uh, World Economic Forum that they anticipate 6% growth uh, on the African continent in the coming years. And that's tremendous. You know, African economies can and should grow. But I think the question we have to confront is, given the inevitability of growth and that growth will happen, how are we going to conserve wildlife um, you know, as that growth occurs? And obviously, wildlife is going to have to be economically competitive with other land uses. Wildlife habitat is going to have to be economically competitive with other land uses if we're going to see elephants and lions and rhinos continue to persist on the landscape. So let's talk about the local population a little bit. I, you know, I, I, I'm open to – I have a lot of romance myself about elephants and lions uh, and rhino. I've never seen any of them in person in the wild. Uh, but would like the idea that I could someday, and I like the idea that they're just there, that we still that they still roam the earth in some dimension, not just in zoos and not just in in highly constrained environments like a zoo. So I like that it's there. But then again, I don't live there, and I think there's a limit to my 
uh, right to dictate to people who do live there how they should uh, behave. And I'm curious if the people there who do interact, uh, whose crops get trampled by the elephants and, and who do, I assume, have some perhaps emotional connection to, to the, these animals, do they have any rom- do they have romance about it like I do uh, or more or less? Do you have any feel for that? So in, in my experience, you know, people, regardless of where you are on the planet – you know, understand that the majesty, you know, of African wildlife, they understand that, you know, it is something special on this planet. You know, at the same time, as special as it is, people are very conscious of the threats that this wildlife um, presents to them and their families, whether it be, you know, elephants trampling crops or, you know, large carnivores like lions or leopards killing livestock. Um, And then, of course, there's always the issue of of wildlife killing people, which does happen with, with more frequency than I think a lot of Westerners realize. You know, if you read the African press, there's regular accounts of, of people who are injured or, or killed by wildlife. They don't make it to, to the, the press here in, in London or in New York. Um, so, you know, I would say that, you know, people value wildlife, but you can value something and still be aware of the threat that it poses to your livelihood and your life. But the suggestion from the campfire programs and others like it are that by creating a monetary value for hunting, uh, communities uh, have a much easier truce with those costs because they're effectively compensated in the form of sharing revenue from the hunting expeditions. Is that right? And that's exactly right. You know, there's an offset um, occurring. And it's not just a question of sharing the revenues. You know, some of that revenue um, goes into the local district councils who then use that to build infrastructure, roads, schools, clinics, wells, uh, things that, you know, people are also using on a day-to-day basis. Um, and it, it does not escape them that, you know, it was the elephants that paid for this. Do you have any feel for how that incentive plays out on the ground, how the awareness that these are precious now, both not just in some emotional sense, but in a financial sense. Uh, I've always thought of it as uh, it makes villagers more likely to report poachers on their on their land or in these areas where the where the animals are. Um, is there anything else going on? Um, so I think you're right about, you know, the the awareness and people being more willing to to report poachers. You know, when uh, when we were working in Mozambique, you know, there was a case where uh, a man was poaching and it was his wife who turned him in. And the reason that his, his wife turned him in was because the arrangement that had been set up in that area was that the hunting concessionaire um, provided the meat um, from the trophy animals to the local villagers. And that's very common, you know, across Africa. I mean, in... Uh, in Tanzania, you know, we've got about 286,000 pounds of meat being distributed in the trophy hunting areas each year. But um, getting back to the Mozambique example, this woman turned her husband in because she was concerned that because he was poaching, uh, it would reduce the meat drop uh, for her family and her village. So people do see the incentives and, um, you know, definitely become much more um, – conscious uh, of what the potential impacts of poaching are if they allow it to persist in their area. I suspect maybe their marriage wasn't so good. That's always a possibility. Just a thought. <laughs> Just a <Yeah>. thought. Because <laughs> uh, you'd think she'd get even more meat if her husband's got – she'd get all the meat, whereas before she'd – otherwise she'd have to share it. Well, but it was a question of what about her relations? elsewhere in the village and them not getting, you know, their share of the meat. Interesting. So what are some of the numbers uh, involved here? Uh, it, you know, you mentioned that the population, uh, the elephant population in Zimbabwe increased dramatically once this, these projects and, and programs were put in place. Do you have a feel for what kind of numbers we're talking about in some of these countries, as well as how many animals get killed um, in the course of a year as part of the hunting, uh, you think you said 274,000 pounds. It's like two elephants. No, I'm kidding. But, but, um, 
Uh, do you have a feel for the magnitudes? Well, in terms of the magnitude of, of take by, by the trophy hunting, um, yeah, as I mentioned, Zimbabwe has the second largest elephant population in Africa, which with about 83,000 individual animals. And um, the, the export of trophies is regulated under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which is a multilateral convention that Zimbabwe and the United States and, and many other countries are party to. And the convention allocates permits to each party country um, each year, you know, dictating you know, how many animals they are actually allowed to export as trophies or for other purposes. Uh, Zimbabwe um, exports less than 1% of its uh, total elephant population each year. Uh, replacement, you know, far outpaces um, take with regard to trophy hunting in that country. Um, I believe it's it's 0.3% um, that are leaving the country, you know, due to trophy hunting. So it's, it's a really, really small uh, amount of animals that's generating a tremendous amount of income and a tremendous amount of of uh, social license for conservation projects. Um, in terms of you know, how, how many animals can be restored through this type of approach, I think about Katata 11 in, in Mozambique. Um, Katatas you know, are, are, um, are Mozambique's hunting areas. They comprise um, a little bit more than 9 million acres in the country. There, there is 11 of them. Um, but they cover about 9 million acres, which is roughly seven and a half Grand Canyon National Parks. And in Katata 11, they've taken a very entrepreneurial approach uh, to, to their, their program. Um, Mozambique you know, went through a, a very long period of, of violent conflict. They fought a war of independence from Portugal that lasted from 1964 until 1975. And then they were embroiled in a civil war from 1977 until 1992. Um, there was still scattered belligerence up until about 2016. But, you know, roughly two plus decades of peace and stability have allowed for some economic and, and social, social progress. So stepping into that in, in 1994 was a South African gentleman named Mark Haldane. And, and Mark is a professional hunter, which is what Africans um, call what we would refer to as a guide or an outfitter. And he took over the lease of Katata 11 uh, from the Mozambican government. And when he got there, the area was almost completely devoid of game. And, and the reason for this was that um, this area, which is in the Zambezi River Delta, was essentially a meat locker for all of the warring factions in the country over the year. Um, Everyone, you know, w would go there to to shoot bush meat, um, to feed rebel forces, to feed national army forces. There was even reports that the Russians uh, were sending in helicopter gunships to gun down the herds of Cape Buffalo, uh, which were then uh, ferried offshore to waiting ships to be canned, um, uh, with the Russians using that meat to feed their troops in Afghanistan. Um, so Mark comes into this, you know. High area of high quality habitat that's lacking the game in 1994. And through a very deliberate and scientific wildlife management program that was subsidized by his hunting concessions in South Africa and Botswana, he increased the Cape Buffalo number from t around 2,100 to more than 21,000. Um, the number of, of sable antelope grew from 44 to over 5,000, um, and so on and so forth. So we can see very dramatic increases um, in, in game populations because of trophy hunting programs, and, and Haldane's operation is, is one example of that. Now, how did he achieve this? Um, first and foremost, you know, he got the local people on his side. And the way he got the local people on his side was through a, a number of, of different ways. You know, first, as I mentioned earlier, Whenever an animal is shot in his concession, um, the meat is either used in camp, um, but the majority of it goes back to the local villages. And you know, that's, a, that's a 
big deal. Um, 80% of the people in Mozambique cannot afford an adequate diet, according to the World Food, food Program. Um, chronic food insecurity is at 24%. So, you know, these these meat drops um, that come from the hunting outfitter uh, are a huge boost, you know, to food security uh, in the region. The second thing he did was was give them jobs. Uh, he employs about 150 people in his camp, including uh, a st- what they call a stick of 20-plus uh, men uh, who are his anti-poaching patrol. Uh, all of his uh, members of his patrol are former poachers themselves, and you know they are are patrolling that concession and making sure that people from outside of the area are not coming in. Uh, and poaching. Now, that's not to say that no poaching occurs. Um, you know, there's there there's some poaching, of course, but they've managed to bring it down to an incidental level, and managed to keep it in check at such um, such a level that you know they've seen the dramatic increases in game numbers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's also worth noting that while Mozambique has been seeing uh, an increase in elephant poaching, um, Mark's concession is is a place that has not seen an increase in elephant poaching. And it's due principally to um, both his building the social license for his operation and getting the local people invested in conservation, um, but also through his his very vigorous anti-poaching efforts. So, which is funded completely out of his revenues, um, along with you know donations from clients. All this are these are examples of what we call in economics the tragedy of the commons, which we've talked about many times on the program. That any one person's incentive to protect a, a fish uh, in the ocean, uh, a lobster in a lobster bed, or a uh, piece an animal in the wild in in Kutata Eleven is limited by the fact that if you let it go, if you decide it's too small or you leave it alone or you don't shoot it or you put it back, if it's fish, to grow up, uh, the odds that you're the one that captures it is close to zero. And so there's a natural tendency to overfish, overgraze, and overhunt these unowned areas. So what you're suggesting is is that this one hunter uh, has created a set of implicit property rights. He still has to deal with the fact that uh, I assume the rule of law is, is not – is enforced in Qatar 11 as, as one might like, right? I assume he has to bring some of his own th- – that group of 20 – the stick of 20 people is, I assume, the, effectively a private police force. That, that's one way to look at it in terms of, of the way that, that justice is handled. When a poacher is arrested, uh, if they are from the surrounding area, they're brought to the local tribal chieftains. Uh, and the local tribal chieftains are the ones who um, hold the trial, um, pass judgment, and and um, determine what the sentence is. Usually, the sentence that that they give is working on some type of conservation project within the Katata. Um, if they're from outside the area, the uh, anti poaching patrol hands them over to the police for the um, for the um, uh, non tribal government to to decide what to do with them. And I'm curious about education. It's a strange thought, but I assume that that there's some – I'm not sure it's a seminar, but that there's some ongoing conversation taking place on the ground about the virtue of, of how we all benefit if these animals thrive and, and, and become sustainable. I think that's a, it's a very – fair thing to say. And I think what what might illustrate that is most recently, you know, Mark's uh, numbers uh, of game animal and uh, game animals in Katata 11 have grown to such a point that uh, they're exceeding their ecological carrying capacity, even with hunting taking place, um, even with allowing local people to legally harvest some of the animals, they still have just um, you know, too many uh, herbivores on the landscape, and it's, it's creating environmental problems. So to to solve that, uh, he partnered recently with um, with the Cabela Family Foundation and the Ivan Carter uh, Wildlife Foundation, and they've begun restoring lions uh, to the Katata to help control the the game herds. And the Lion Restoration Project has the full support of the local people. 
which I think is a testament to the the social license that has built up over the years. The people have seen the benefits that wildlife provide them. Um, and have welcomed the lions back into the area with full knowledge that you know they could create some problems down the line, but also full confidence that those problems you know will be addressed in a way that um, is uh, is acceptable. Now it's worth noting that these lions, uh, the intent is that they will never be hunted. Um, they brought 24 back, which is uh, effectively two prides with some redundancy built in. And the lions themselves are the subject of a long-term scientific study uh, looking at what happens when lions recolonize uh, their former habitat. But, you know, to your point that, you know, people understand the value of conservation as these programs mature, I think that this is a prime illustration of that. We've got an animal that's very difficult for people to live with, and yet they're opening, they're, they're welcoming it back with open arms. Uh, because they've seen the benefits that conservation can provide their communities. So just to remind listeners, Kutata 11, a Kutata is just a, a certain type of region where hunting is allowed. There's 11 of them. So this happens to be the one that this entrepreneur, Mark Haldane, has been working in, right? Correct. And do you have an idea of how many people live there in Kutata 11? You said it's there, there's the 11 and combined or the equivalent of seven Grand Canyons, which is very helpful. Um if you know something about the size of the Grand Canyon, if you don't, it's not helpful at all, but it helps me. Uh, and most of us don't have a feel for what, say, a million acres is. We have no idea. Is that Rhode Island or the uh, Appalachians? But uh, Kutai 11 is pretty large, evidently. Do we have a feel for how many people live there on the ground? So just to clarify, it's the entire Katata system that's uh, more than 9 million acres or, or seven Correct. and a half times yeah. of Grand Canyon National Park. I, I don't have um, an idea of the total number of, of people who live in the Katata itself. The Katata itself is um, a little shy of 300,000 acres. Um, most of the people who do live there live on the periphery um, of the Katata where there's, you know, slightly more in infrastructure, not much. It's generally a place that you you have to fly into. It's very difficult to access over land. Um, but I don't have a, a, a solid population number that I can give you. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. But, I, you know, I, the, the periphery thing is a big deal because I know from Yellowstone that, you know, ranchers and people who are, are raising uh, uh, cattle and other domesticated animals on the edges of Yellowstone, where the park ends, uh, a lot of the animals don't just stay in the park. They don't, they don't when they see the, uh, the uh, sign that says leaving Yellowstone Park, they don't turn around. Uh, that sign is only on the roads anyway. So there's always a constant, in the United States, there's a constant issue between ranchers and wildlife uh, folk who because of those spillover effects, just it's just the way it is, and I assume that's true uh, in Mozambique as well. It absolutely is, and and one thing that illustrates that in relation to the lions is there was um, a, a a lion population to the north of Katata Eleven, or I should say, there is a lion population to the north of Katata Eleven. Since they've reintroduced the two prides into Katata Eleven, lions have begun moving south, um, particularly males. Um, to um, to mate with the females that have been reintroduced into the Katata. And at least one of the females is now known to be pregnant. But obviously those lions are moving through areas where they may or may not encounter people. I'd love to know how they spread that word, but uh, funny how that works. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, it's not an app, but presumably, but they did, they did find out. Um, now, the, that process, and you wrote an article about it, which uh, – you know, I found utterly fascinating the idea that you would – these are, I remember these lions came from South Africa. The idea mm -hmm. that you would take 24 lions, uh, quote, two prides, and then put them on a, a helicopter or an airplane and fly them into Mozambique seems like a very crazy idea. So just what are some of the logistics of that? How, how, did, they, how did they pick the animals? How did they subdue the animals? How did they – and once they were done and got them – into Mozambique, what do you what do you take? Uh, you draw straws. Say, hey, okay, you you go over here. You go over there. How far apart are they? It's crazy. It seems like a remarkably challenging 
ecological problem to to get that to to go well. Um, it, it was, but by, by, by all accounts, um, I was not part of the tra- of the translocation, so I can't speak to the details of it. But what I do know is that the the partners in this venture, you know, Mark Holiday and the Cabela Family Foundation, the Ivan Carter Wildlife Foundation, they they turned to South Africa, you know, to source the lions because um, unlike the United States and, and Canada and some other countries, um, South Africa allows for private ownership of, of wildlife. And a lot of, you know, the conservancies that people visit on their holiday and, um, you know, go uh, to for photo tourism in South Africa, many of those animals are privately owned. Um, and that can range from giraffes to elephants to, to lions. And it's one reason that South Africa has so much wildlife. But um, they, they contracted with a veterinarian uh, who went to South Africa, and he was tasked with finding 24 genetically distinct lions, um, which I don't know how you do that. I'm not a veterinarian, <laughs> but I can imagine that it's, it's, um, it's not something that just gets accomplished in a weekend. So he went you to South just- Africa. You don't just pour over the FBI database, DNA database, probably. Yeah. No, no. Um, yeah, there was a lot of legwork involved, I'm sure. So after you know sourcing 24 genetically distinct lions and, and acquiring them, uh, the lions were sedated, and they were placed in an airplane and, and flown to Mozambique. Uh, this was the largest international translocation of lions in history. And once they were in Mozambique, they were put into an enclosure um, within the Katada, where they spent some time to acclimate to their new environment, um, new temperatures, new smells, et cetera, et cetera. And then on August 5th of last year, the doors to the enclosure were opened, um, and the lions left at their own pace. Um, They had formed prides, and they almost immediately began hunting the game that they, they found within the Katada. And um, it's it's a story that that I feel needs to be told more because I think it's it's just as dramatic as the restoration of wolves to Yellowstone, but it shows that private enterprise and private initiative can have a very similar impact um, that you know government run programs can have. It reminds me of a uh, of the Far Side, the cartoon uh, Gary Larson just. I, I'm just imagining the dialogue when they woke up and they turned to the lion to their left, the lion to their right, and said, "Whoa, what are we doing here?" Uh, um, but they they went out, and is there some idea of what the size of that lion population in Kutat Eleven could grow to? Is twenty four is that a seed population, or is it more of like, well? It's, it's this is what we expect it to stay at. Is that you know? There, there's a wonderful book called uh, "Why Big Fierce Animals Are Rare," mm-hmm. uh, and it and it talks about the fact that obviously large animals that have a lot of pounds and eat a lot of protein, they need a lot of stuff underneath them that's smaller to uh, sustain them. And so I don't know how many lions Katahdin Eleven can hold. Is it 250 or is it more like 30? Do we have any idea? So the intent is for this population to grow. You use the phrase seed population, and that's exactly what the um, the people behind this project intend for these 24 lions to be. Uh, you know, we, we, we shouldn't look at Katata 11 in isolation. It's part of something larger called the Marmu Ecosystem, which is Mozambique's only internationally recognized wetland. Um, the larger ecosystem includes other Katatas, a forest conservation area, some agricultural lands. Um, so it's a much larger system um, that we're, we're looking at. And um, part of what they had to do from this project was get buy-in from people you know elsewhere um, in the ecosystem because it is expected that this will be a seed population that will eventually grow um, you know into possibly several hundred animals um, spread out over the landscape and, and this is all part of the post-war you know restoration of, of, of Mozambique um, these these animals were were in you know the lower Zambezi Valley uh, up until fairly recently 
and um, you know the end of the conflict you know has presented a a great opportunity to to bring them back and um, I at least am personally grateful that Mozambique has the conservation system that it does have that allows for this type of private enterprise to um, to you know speed up you know this kind of restoration because Mozambique is a is still a, a very poor country um, it does have a, a fast growing economy but um, it's not growing uh, at the kind of pace where the government could be expected to shoulder a project like this. Long-time listeners will know that there was a period in Econ Talk's history where I mentioned the word prairie fairly often. There, there's an Econ Talk drinking game. I don't know if prairie's on it, but there was a period where it should have been on it. And uh, the reason I like the idea of a prairie uh, is that a prairie is not something you can easily build from scratch. Um, you, you might know what's in a prairie after it's done, but knowing the ingredients is not enough to bake a cake. You, there's a certain order that things have to grow, and and if you don't do the order correctly, you're going to mess it up. You're not going to get a prairie. You're not going to get a cake. And the challenge, of course, is that we're sort of – there's a bunch of factors you can't control, and – the other thing long-time listeners will know is my favorite Hayek quote, which is the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. So one of the challenges I would think of this kind of project is that introducing 24 lions into a existing – I won't call it the balance of nature because I think that's a misleading metaphor that's a mistake actually. But introducing them into whatever's on the ground at the time is going to have implications and effects that you can't forecast easily. And we're not very long into the project. I think it happened last August. We're something like five months in, um, six months in. Have we learned anything yet about this? How worried were the people behind this that it might you know, get out of control or not work well or lead to consequences that people didn't anticipate? Obviously, threats to the local human population would be one example, but more generally to the whole complex of, of wildlife that, that you've already alluded to. Well, my understanding is that you know they, they undertook this project very, very deliberatively, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the the lions that have been reintroduced are the subject of a long term scientific study um, that will, I'm sure, produce you know I'm sure will produce multiple peer reviewed articles. Um, in terms of their concern going in, I think it was a a measured concern. Uh, I, I think that they. They treaded very carefully, and that's why they started with two prides. You know, two is better than one in case something happens to the one disease outbreak, you know, what have you. Um, you know, but they didn't go for six. Um, you know, so they're starting small, and, and they're going to monitor, you know, what happens over, over time uh, as this population becomes more rooted and begins to expand, and we move from two prides to three to four, um, and how they interact with you know the restored game populations that that live in in the delta as well, um, that's going to be a key key factor um, since that you know is the basis of of the business that was able to bring the lions back in the first place. What do lions eat besides things that are smaller than they are? Um, they're Mostly. eating. <laughs> I, they're eating um, water buck. They're eating rig buck. They're eating, um, you know, Cape buffalo calves. Um, they're they're pursuing, you know, whatever game they feel they can take down that's present in the delta. Uh, the only thing I don't think that they've pursued, or I haven't heard of them pursuing, yet is crocodile. And pardon my naivete, a, a pride is not. Uh, a pride of 12 is not six females and six males, or is it? No, no, it doesn't have to be six females and six males. It, it, it can be. There's. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the, the gender mix you know, w would typically be. I'm not a lion expert, but it, it's, um, it's not evenly split necessarily. My impression is that, that the men sit around all day and the women do all the work. Is, the, is that true? That, that's sort of the, the joke, um, and, and you do see that. The, the women do do a, um, a fair bit of hunting, but you will see male lions hunting as well. 
And there's a strange interaction, which one would not imagine, between this project and U.S. endangered species law. What is it? Uh, well, I think you know one thing to think about, you know, in relation to this project and and the U.S. Endangered Species Act, is that we've seen, you know, a very concerted effort since 2015, and and the the affair of Cecil the Lion um, that you know sort of captivated worldwide attention to list African wildlife under the U.S. Endangered Species Act for the effectively the sole purpose of prohibiting the import of hunting trophies of those animals. And if this is allowed to continue, um, it's going to cause a lot of destabilization in African conservation programs. You know, as we've talked about, you know, here today, uh, hunting plays a major and significant role in, in conserving the lands between the parks um, that, that need protection as well. Uh, the places where photo tourism is not viable, but where the wildlife habitat um, is still of high quality. And about 70% of the global trophy hunting market is based in the United States. And that's a f figure according to the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Uh, if that market is effectively closed because people can no longer import their hunting trophies, operations like Mark Haldane's are going to have a very tough go of things. Um, even you know, listing um, lions themselves you know, is problematic. There was research conducted um, by, I, I believe it was researchers from the University of Pretoria that indicated that if lion hunting were to end in Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia, um, almost 15 million acres of conservation areas would suffer decreased economic viability and become increasingly vulnerable to development. Um, to put that in context, that's about seven Yellowstone National Parks. So we have to tread very carefully um, with how we apply the Endangered Species Act uh, in relation to African wildlife, because there could be a lot of unintended consequences um, for wildlife, negative consequences, uh, if these species um, are listed and, and trophy import bans go into effect as, as a result. Um, yeah, you know, this is especially true given that the United States is making a very concerted effort to engage uh, its partners in Africa. You know, we would be sending a, a very, in my opinion, wrong signal by discouraging trophy hunting um, because it's the a market-based means of conservation. Um, the U.S. strategy is is very heavily focused on on free markets and and helping African nations benefit from free markets. And at the same time, you know, partnership means meeting uh, people where they are. And these are indigenous African programs that have the support of local people, that have the support of local governments, that have the support of national governments. Um, to disrupt them in, in, in such a severe way as by closing um, the U.S. trophy hunting market um, would, would probably be a, a very significant strategic mistake on the part of the United States. You know, th there's a lot of discussion, too, that, you know, trophy hunting doesn't contribute um, a lot to African economies. Um, there's research out there showing that, you know, the actual cash contribution is is around four hundred and twenty six million dollars. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot. But to put it in context, that contribution um, is three times the amount collected in entrance fees to all of Africa's national parks. So. You know, we shouldn't discount um, the amount of, of money that that trophy hunting is providing for conservation, um, even though it may seem small by our standards. You're pretty passionate about this, uh, but you said you're not a hunter of big game. Uh, why are you so? Why do you care so much? Yeah, you know, I've had some really peak experiences with with wildlife in general, but African wildlife in particular, and it's something that that I would like other people to have in the future. You know, like we talked about earlier, Africa is is a fast growing continent and there is a looming question out there. I mean, the economies will continue to grow. Uh, these landscapes will continue to be developed. The, the big question is, will wildlife still have a place um, 20, 30, 40 years from now? 
and if it's going to, it needs to be economically competitive with other land uses. Um, we're already starting to see the system fray. You know, Tanzania has, um, you know, finalized plans to to dam a river in the Sulu Game Reserve. You know, one of the premier protected areas on the continent. And you know, if if the Sulu, which you know, photo tourists from around the world flock to each year, um, can't be protected. Um, we should be very, very concerned about places like the, the campfire areas in Zimbabwe and places like Katata 11 in Mozambique, and we should be doing everything we can to make them economically competitive. I want to go back to um, something you mentioned a few minutes ago about the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone. I also wrote about that in my in my book, The Invisible Heart. I, I want to give you my thumbnail version and see if, if you think it's Right, and if not, what needs to be corrected? But at some point in the past, either because wolves were scary to people, or occasionally would um, tear up uh, livestock and uh, ranchers near Yellowstone, wolves were basically eliminated, and that allowed things that wolves eat, like elk, to grow without any uh, restraints other than the, the land. We have a tragedy, the commons problem there, that the elk don't take count of the fact that they're wearing down the the um, the grass, and they don't take account of the fact that they're eating virtually everything near streams, uh, so-called riparian areas where aspen and alder and other things are sustaining the beaver population. And at some point, I want to say in the last 20 or so years, a, a small group of wolves was in, reintroduced into Yellowstone that allowed – that culled some of the elk population, particularly the sick uh, – Reduce the obviously the carrying um, the next generation the the baby elk that were coming out because uh, they were more vulnerable. Reduce the size of the elk herd uh, within the park and uh, brought the beavers back, which which is a fabulous example of the complexity of of systems like this and the the Hayekian uh, warning about things that we don't fully understand. You'd think that getting rid of wolves in Yellowstone Park would have allowed beavers to thrive because you'd think that wolves, if anything, eat beavers, but they don't eat them in any number. And they eat things that make it harder for beavers to build their dams because there's no willow and alder. And as a result, reintroducing wolves has been great for beaver. Uh, my understanding is that the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone has been a, a great success. Do, do, you, do you perceive that to be the case? Um, do I have that right? I think it depends on who you ask. Yeah, I think there's there's people in the environmental community for sure who would see it as as a, a great success. I think there's people in the livestock industry who would say it's been too much of a success. Now, obviously, there's there's a middle ground there that you know most of us are probably resting on. Um, you know, from a personal standpoint, um, you know, I would have preferred to have seen wolves um, come down on their own from the Nine Mile Valley over time, as opposed to um, being physically reintroduced, you know, on, on the ground. Um, and that's largely has to do with just, you know, what the public sentiment ar around wolves was back in 1994. Um, but I really think, you know, how you judge the success of, of conservation efforts really depends on where you sit in relation to them. So we had Pete Geddes on of the American Prairie Reserve, which has tried to we'll put a link up to that old episode, but what they try to do is they've tried to give the ranchers an incentive to give um, passageways to animals, predators, and non-predators across their land, understanding that it's going to cause sometimes loss of, of livestock, but in allowing them to be brand their 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 meat or whatever else they do is eco-friendly or prairie-friendly or whatever you call it. Uh, that's an interesting way to solve these kind of tensions that uh, might otherwise be there. Absolutely. And I think, you know, ventures like the American Prairie Reserve are, are really products of the, the lessons that were learned from things like the Yellowstone Wolf Reintroduction. And, and conservation is a learning process. And, and I think that that's OK. Um, we just have to make sure that we, we all keep an open mind um, and are willing to, to receive the lessons that we're being given. Now, the last thing I want to mention is something that intrigues me, and I think it's Again, there's a lot of romance around it. I certainly find it romantic, but again, I don't live in these places, so 
it's easy to be romantic about it, but that's the so-called rewilding movement. Uh, I read an interesting book by George Monbiot. Uh, I think that's, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but I think the book's called Feral, F-E-R-A-L. I might have that wrong, but we'll link to it. Um, and what his book is mostly about is the reintroduction of native species to the United Kingdom and parts of uh, the Black Forest area and, and Middle Eastern Europe. And I mean, it's a really remarkable uh, Extraordinary idea that we think of, I'll use the UK as an example, United Kingdom. It, you know, it, it's we think of it as a nation of sheep, <laughs> a place where there's a, you know, when we think of the, the British landscape, the English countryside, the Scottish countryside, we, we see uh, sheep grazing, and uh, but they don't belong there. <laughs> they, they, they are there only through a lot of intervention on the part of human beings, and uh, it used to be a lot wilder and a lot greener in certain ways because the sheep eat a lot of grass. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on the, and obviously the American Prairie Reserve is an example of this, trying to recreate something akin to what Lewis and Clark saw. It's a beautiful idea. I love the idea of it. I don't know if it's really practical and whether it'll work, but I, I do like the idea of it. Right. Well, I mean, I think, you know, when we think about things like rewilding, and I'm certainly not an expert on the subject, particularly as it relates to the United Kingdom, but, you know, if we look at the, the mega trends that are occurring and, and the fact that, you know, across the West, and I don't just mean the American West, but, um, you know, the, the, the Western world, uh, populations are becoming more and more urban um, and, and our rural areas are becoming um, depopulated. Um, I don't see that reversing anytime soon. And that leaves us with the question of what do we do with these lands? You know, what is the, the best and highest use, as it were? And so I think that the, the rewilding proponents um, are a, a valuable part of the conversation about to trying to decide, you know, what comes next. Um, but I would proceed with caution, you know, because the reality is that, you know, it, it is no longer, you know, 1867. Um, things have changed dramatically um, on the landscape since that time. And trying to recapture some mythic past is probably not necessarily um, – you know, something that, that is going to lead to anything other than disappointment. So I, I think we need to be pragmatic. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we also need to be sensitive to the people who, who still live in these places and, um, you know, make sure that they are bought into whatever conservation programs are being implemented. Because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will decide, you know, whether these programs succeed or fail, because they're the ones who are going to have to live with them um, day to day. My guest today has been Catherine Semser. She is a research fellow with PERC, the Property and Environment Research Center. Catherine, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>